I'm here to talk about serverless functions. I'm Brian Douglas, and I'll go ahead and talk about what I'm going to talk about. So this is like my personal experience um, using functions in an application uh, for me to actually save money. Uh, I had a side project, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, I mentioned I'm Brian Douglas, but I go by B Dougie uh, in most, most common places. Uh, that's me on Twitter. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more about who I am, uh, feel free to just go to Twitter. Uh, descriptions in the bio, and uh, that's all I'll do. I'll talk about myself. Cool. So this talk sort of focused around a lot about legacy systems. Um, I like learning from the past because I've only been doing this like about four and a half years, um, web development that is, um, and I like learning about what happened before. So speaking about legacy systems, um, this talk's also going to be about baseball. Anybody a baseball fan out there? Yeah, me neither. All right. So. All the slides here are baseball.netlify.com. Uh, Netlify is a company I work for. You just put sites up, and it's easy. And uh, so feel free to write that down or watch the Twitters for the link at the end. Um, so this is the, one of the first baseball cards. Um, baseball actually started around 1846. Uh, it was a, I guess it was a fun sport to play up in the uh, uh, upstate New York. Um, this baseball card is like one of the oldest ones. It's actually sold for half a million dollars. So if you guys like... Comparing, it's like seed funding startup. Um, and then obviously, it'd be a 1,000 more if you put it on the blockchain. So if you guys want to like uh, really make money, put baseball cards on the blockchain, because I think that's the way we're going. All right, so 1846, when baseball started. About the early, early 1900s, 1869, we had two different leagues in baseball. So we had the National League, and then we had the American League. So these are like two different clubs. I like sports. I just don't like baseball. So I don't know much more about that. So that's as far as I'm going to go there. Uh, that's when we had two different clubs to play baseball. And then in the 1900s, um, they actually started playing against each other for the championship. For, so like the actual national championship, uh, those clubs would play together up until 2000. And there was actually a big change. Uh, but prior to 2000, or sorry, in 2000, those two clubs became Major League Baseball um, as far as financially. Uh, before, all clubs were pay, would pay their own players. Um, so like West Coast, or sorry, American League teams would get paid by American League uh, club. And then the national team would get paid by the national team. In 2000, they merged, so now the paycheck comes from the MLB. So just a little footnote in history. And then 1997 was the first year that outside of the championship games, so if you guys, we got two baseball teams here. It's the, the Giants and the A's. In the 80s, they had like a big earthquake. During that time, those teams both played each other in the championship, so that doesn't really happen very often. And, but now in the regular season, American League and National League actually play each other. And as I mentioned before, we do have two teams in the Bay Area. Anybody live in the Bay Area? Anybody come outside? There's like another baseball team somewhere besides here. All right, so we have two teams. I live in Oakland, so um, I know that I've been to Oakland A's game, never been to the Giants game. Again, not a big fan of baseball, but in the 50s, baseball came to the West Coast. Uh, before that, the Pacific Northwest Coast League actually started first here on the West Coast. So a lot of people think like the Giants and the A's, those are like the baseball teams been here forever. Um, there were two teams before that which was the Seals and the Oakland Oaks. So if you're like in like Oaklandish or some hipster shops, you can like buy these like shirts and stuff like that and they look really cool. Um, they look really good with mustaches too. I, I just noticed that. So those are the two teams. So what I'm trying to get at, baseball's been here for a long time, so people actually care about it. Um, I also found this while I was searching through baseball uh, notes. Uh, for the actual Oakland Oaks, had the first black uh, colored baseball player ever and played in like an actual uh, proper baseball game, and his name was Jimmy Sexton. Uh, he was Canadian, and they tried to pass him off as um, Native American, and then they found out. He only lasted two games, and then they found out he was actually African descent, so he wasn't allowed to play. Um, and the history goes on after that, but we won't get into that. So that's it for history. That's it for baseball. Uh, I wanted to talk about that because, like I said, I like to learn about history um, and how things have changed. Um, and speaking of legacy, legacy systems and stuff that doesn't change, I want to talk about public transportation. <laughs> uh, so we, in the Bay Area, if you guys aren't from here, you happen to like fly in for this. We have the BART and we have the Muni in San Francisco. So this is how we get around uh, to like go to work. Some people are lucky enough to get paid enough to actually take lifts to work. That's pretty awesome. Uh, if you're hiring, let me know. Um, so back in the 70s uh, and then the early 80s, we had Muni and BART. Uh, and nothing's changed since then. And I, I bring all this up because like, this is a JavaScript conference, and you guys are like, probably, this guy is like, too much. And I know in the comments on YouTube, they're going to be like, man, this guy again. Um, but I do this because I live in Oakland, so on the right side of the East Bay. Um, that's where I live. Um, 
And then if you look on the other side, that's where I commute to work. So it's about roughly about almost eight miles, and it takes me about an hour and 10 minutes on the BART in Muni. So that's like my life uh, every morning. And I say that I did all the baseball stuff because on those two different arrows, those are all baseball stadiums. So my commute's affected whenever there's a baseball game. And twice a year, there's this thing called the Bay Series, where the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants actually play. Um, and it happens twice a year for like seven games. So like, I just call out, I call it sick. I work from home those, those weeks. Um, so keep in mind, uh, I think around June or July usually when the first series actually happens. So if, um, this is like a warning for all, everybody that's here. If you're new here, don't ride the bar around that time. Uh, it's turned. So I had a question basically, when is baseball? And I had this question because when I moved to the Bay Area, um, I got a place in Oakland really quickly. Um, it was quicker than most people I heard of. It took me about a couple days. I like walked around Berkeley and North Oakland, found a place, got the lease like by that Monday. And then I think I worked during the week of the first Bay Series. I went to Target, like a, the Metreon Target, got like a blanket, pillow, like all this like bedding because in an air mattress because all my stuff, I'm actually from Florida where baseball really doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so I came out here and I'm like, oh cool, I'll just get all my stuff and then get on the BART. And then it turns out like the Bay Series had just unloaded and like all these drunk A's fans and Giants fans were on the train and I was holding like my blankets. I'm like, man, this sucks. So what I did right after that, like the next weekend, I started mapping out an app called Hustlin'. And it's just an app basically, like again, I'm not a baseball fan, but I wrote this app to tell me when there's a baseball game so that way I can avoid it. Um, and this app really consists of, I originally started with a Rails JSON API. And the beauty of this is that baseball happens every year who would have thought? Um, so I just rebuild this app every year with like a new, new technology. Uh, and this year, if you guys aren't getting the gist yet, I built it on serverless last year, and it worked out really well for me. So I originally started with the Rails app, Postgres, Postgres database. I use Heroku as my server. I also use Heroku um, because I knew how to use it. I was a Rails dev. And uh, it had this, um, basically it's a cron job. You can set up cron jobs to send notifications. So I did a scheduler, and uh, it was great. It cost me seven bucks a month. I basically, for a whole year, even though baseball only happens 10 months out of the year, I paid for a whole year of telling me when there's baseball games. And this is what it looks like. So this is my JSON data coming from Heroku. And also to mention, I'm not gathering all baseball games. I'm just gathering home games for two teams. Uh, and then I have a, the scheduler to basically tell me when there's a home game. Uh, I, said, I get an email at this point every morning around 3 AM. Um, I picked like a UTC number, which was going to be in the morning. So I just, want to wake up with an actual email. And it just says, hey, there's a baseball game today. And that's pretty much, that's the app. Um, I've gone through this every year. I built a, a Rails version, Ember version, a React version, a React Native version. Um, one year I built two versions. Uh, so it's about, yeah, I built a, quite a different ver uh, few versions. Uh, but this was the first year that I built a new API rather than new client. Uh, I also want to point out that I love ESPN uh, because they put all their game data in tables, HTML tables, so it's very easy to scrape. Does anybody work at ESPN? OK, cool. Don't tell them this. Uh, this is great. This is perfect. I also I work for a company called Netlify. Uh, we're a sponsor, so if you just go in the corner and next to coffee, uh, pick up a sticker. Um, I work at a company called Netlify, and we're, we build our, like we host and we deploy sites that are Jamstack ready. Uh, and what Jamstack basically means is like JavaScript, APIs, and markup. So it's like another way to say front end site or a static site. It's just easier to have a list of things and a checkbox and say, are you Jamstack? Then you can host with us. Uh, if you don't know what Jamstack is, uh, this is not Jamstack. This is like a monolith. Uh, did anybody ever have this when it's a kid at all? All right, yeah, my mom actually, she bought this once for me and my brothers, and she never made that mistake ever again. Because um, the problem with this is like, you get, you get jam and you get peanut butter, but then by the bottom of the jar, you only get peanut butter. Um, and I'm not a fan of peanut butter. So what I like is the Jamstack architecture. We have two separate jars. So I have my client, my API, and this is, I built this originally, this baseball app, like with the idea that I wanted to test different technologies every year. Um, well, I didn't start out that way, but by the second year, I was like, hey, let me try something different. And it was really easy because by the second year, when I decided to go from Ember to React, I was able to just switch. If you guys didn't see that, it's really quick. So I was able to switch out the different flavor of JavaScript framework. So like I could, if I wanted to do Vue this year, which I think that's hot now. I, I don't know. I've never used it, but uh, apparently it's hot. I could try it if I wanted to. Um, but I, I wanted to try something different with the peanut butter, which actually do serverless instead of a Rails API. Um, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So 
I have a Rails API. I've got all this stuff. I have a JSON database. Have a, uh, I didn't mention that. I do web scraping through like Nokogiri. Um, pretty basic stuff. I've got cron job notifications. It all works. I've got the JavaScript and the markup. That's all pretty much React Native, React on the front end, Ember on the front end. Like that works pretty much. And the cool thing is I can host those in separate places. So like Netlify, it actually costs zero dollars a month um, because we have, we have a very generous free plan. Um, also, I work there, so I can do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> so I use that. So that's actually pretty pretty nice. But with the Rails stuff, uh, I was hosting on Heroku because that's what I knew and it was quickest. Uh, but that costs. Um, it started to add up because it's seven dollars a month. Because during this time, I built this app. They went through that whole transition of like everything's free to then everything's free up to like 12 hours, and then they, they rate limited you or whatever they're doing now. And then, um, so then I'm like, oh, I'm going to just pay $7 so I can get my notifications when I want them. Um, but yeah, that became problematic because that added up, mainly because like I wasn't really watching with baseball. Um, so I never actually killed the app during the two months that baseball wasn't happening. It's, it's actually four months or whatever. Um, I also added up, it was $84 a year. And last year, we were really lucky that San Francisco had a horrible season. So prices were actually like $6 a game at one point, um, which actually was nice because I didn't have to actually watch my app because I knew nobody was going to games. Um, but $84, I mean, I could have, like this, the first three row, I, we could have went games and got beers. I already got a beer, but you guys could have went to the game. I don't, I don't buy beers for people. <laughs> All right. So $84 is a lot of money. I mean, we're, most of us are devs and we're in the Bay Area. Like, really, we do get paid enough to pay $84 a year. Like, pay for tools, like definitely. Uh, but I wanted to try something different, which was serverless. And anybody ever heard this term? It's like a buzzword. Now it's like a real thing now. Uh, so serverless is like this thing. Martin Fowler wrote, wrote a book. And like in the beginning, he wrote like this whole description. Uh, but what I like to point out is like serverless is really just functions as a, as a service. There's another thing like where serverless will be used like with Firebase for like hosting, uh, like your database and stuff like that. So like what, and I have this term as well, uh, sorry, the keyword AWS as well, because that's what I'm using. Uh, keep in mind that AWS is that's one solution to serverless. There's like a lot of things you can do to get serverless working. Um, but I also want to point out that there is a server, despite it being called serverless. Um, <laughs> but even though there is a server, and this is called serverless, like we have wireless internet, which is like working on my phone right now. It's how I'm changing slides. Um, same thing, there's wires and wireless internet, there's servers and serverless. So let's, let's get past that part. Let's just start shipping code. So I just wanted to point out. Uh, and like, I don't even care about any of that. Like, my goal was basically spend less money. That's all I cared about. Because uh, I wanted to build this app. And the other thing is, like, a lot of you haven't heard of this app because it's on the App Store, even though I have an iOS app. Uh, because I was very terrified of people costing me money to use a, a junk app that I created. So I've never shipped, like, I almost shipped it to the App Store. And I'm like, wait, hold on. I started doing numbers and like, Heroku's going to like charge me like out the wazoo about this app. So I never actually shipped it. Uh, and I decided to go serverless for this reason, because I wanted to save money. Um, so let me break down some of the code. This is like my only screen of code. You guys are like baseball, Bart, and now we have one page of code. So this is like, this is the code that I ship my functions with. I do have a JSON uh, table on another page. I also, this code's also open source. So if you want to get a link at the end, uh, you can definitely check it out. Um, but that's the code. Like it's just some node. Exports, so I got functions inside of that. And I have one function that says today. It's called today. And I run it, and it just goes to my JSON database and then figures out if baseball is today. And that's like where I'm exporting JSON. And that's like the bread and butter of most of my app. I use that same JSON database to basically figure out if I need to send a notification, or whether it's a baseball game. If there's no baseball game, then it says there's no baseball. And if there is a baseball game, it will send me the baseball game. And that's pretty simple at that point. Uh, I did mention AWS. There are like a at this point, there's a ton of solutions. When I first started, AWS is like the, the most, ad, I don't even say it advanced. That's a, a, the wrong word to use. Um, I guess mature at that time, AWS was the Lambda was actually the most mature, so that's why I'm using it. Uh, but there's a, a whole other selections uh, of things you can actually use. And to point out again, like this is the, the JAM architecture. Um, so I do have a JSON API. Um, and this is my Hustlin architecture. So like that's, that's basically everything that powers every single client. So when I do decide to like switch to view or switch to anything else, like my API is now going to be much less. And I'll get into that, what it is. Uh, so remember my goal, spend less money. I have a JSON API. I've got cron jobs. I've got a database. Uh, and I'm doing some uh, very light web scraping, thanks to ESPN. Um, again, 
if you work for there, or if you don't work there, don't tell them that I'm doing this. This is a top secret. All right, so now I have this serverless API, and I built this. Now, when you go to AWS, anybody ever use AWS at all? It's pretty easy to use, right? Like you just start doing drop down windows and uploading zip files. Like it's amazing. I love it. Um, well, so there's a, it's though it costs less money, there's a little more hoops to jump through. So to do my database, I had to use DynamoDB. Um, so I never used it before. But if you ever use like a Mongo or a key value store, it's not really that crazy. Um, you just have to like read really thick books or do tutorials or something like that. Um, but most of it's like pretty light documentation, especially if you're just shipping JSON data back and forth. So not too, too bad there. Um, my, JSON, my JSON API is actually being served through API Gateway. So that's what I actually get an actual endpoint from, um, my AWS Lambda. So that was pretty straightforward too. And then from my web scraping and as well as my notifications actually firing the crons, I'm using uh, Lambda, this running functions. And these, uh, I mentioned functions as a service, like these are functions that I'm just shipping and deploying. Uh, it's pretty straightforward there. And I, I, I like it because there's not, like with Rails, anybody have, do Rails? Is that a thing that people still do? Okay, cool. Um, like Rails is a lot of ceremony that you have to do. Uh, the cool thing is that you do have a lot of generators that do all that work for you. But then at the end of the day, when I just had JSON data, I had this big hefty Rails database with Postgres database with all this other Rails code. To tell me when there was a baseball game for like two different teams. So I find that this, though this is not as elegant, um, I found it's actually a lot more straightforward because I'm just shipping functions. And then finally, there's this tool called CloudWatch that I'm using under the hood to send my crons. CloudWatch, I'm not really using it properly. Uh, I'm just sending notifications, uh, but it actually will give you like uh, oh, ping messages and stuff like that. So like if you do have some sort of survey you need to get like up to date messages from um, and analytics from, you can use CloudWatch. I'm not a CloudWatch expert because I'm only used this much. So I'm sure some people are like, no, that's not what you do with it. But this is what I do with it. Um, and then I'm doing a lot more Lambda. So my notifications, like this year, hopefully this year I'll have notifications that happen right before the game starts and when the game ends. So like that's my new feature I want to add in a month. Uh, baseball starts next month, so be scared. All right, and this is basically, this is me hustling. Uh, that was a pun that I just kind of butchered. But anyway, this is my hustling app. And uh, that's all I had to do. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of steps that I had to do. Uh, but my goal at the end of the day, since I'm only writing this app once a year, uh, and all I had to do just, I literally just shipped uh, this morning, if you look at my open source code, uh, my last commit is like update to 2008 schedules because I realized I never did that. Um, so that was all I had to do this year was just update the schedules, like run the actual command and do it. And now I have baseball ready for this year. Um, and I actually achieved my goal because uh, I was spending, I'm spending less money uh, because instead of running a server constantly, like it's what you're getting out of Heroku uh, or anything else when you run a, a full server, I'm just invoking functions by themselves. So. This is all the stuff that I'm actually doing functions for. So the question is like, how much does this cost? And I have your answer, but let me go through a couple more slides before I tell you. Uh, so like with Lambda, you get a million requests for free. Um, and that's monthly too as well. So I actually calculated how many times I'd have to run this app to actually start paying. And if I counted all the seconds of the day and ran every single second, it would take me 11 days to actually start paying for Lambda, um, which is pretty nice. Especially since I'm not, I'm not an enterprise, I'm not a startup. Uh, I'll probably put this on the blockchain soon because um, I think you get, I heard you get a lot of money from that. So, uh, hustling blockchain ICO coming up soon. It's going to be hot. Um, but it's going to take me a long time to, for my app to actually cost me money. So, I'm actually really excited about finally getting my app on the App Store because I know that you guys are going to make me, like, you're not going to take food out of, my, out of my son's mouth because you want to find out where there's a baseball. Just kidding. Don't be scared to use this, it costs nothing. And then DynamoDB, it, it's actually kind of pricey. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's 25, 25 cents per GB or gigabit. And um, it, since I only have two home games and it's only JSON data, it's, it's not even close to like actually being charged. So I've yet to be charged for that. Uh, CloudWatch, since I'm not using it properly, it's free. Uh, <laughs> but if I wanted like monitoring and archiving of all the like all the uh, notifications I'm sending, then that would actually cost money, and it's actually kind of expensive. Uh, but for this case, it's actually free for me. And, uh, and again, JSON data for two home games, uh, it's not enough to get charged for API Gateway, um, which is nice because I've been flying on their radar for the past two years. Um, yeah, so that kind of sums it up. 
Uh, I have a uh, Lambda. It's got API gateway doing the JSON data. I'm storing every, it's a key value store. The JSON just goes straight to the key value store, um, and that's DynamoDB. Uh, I'm using CloudWatch for cron jobs as well, just to reiterate. And I started doing something towards the end of last year when I, fig when I figured out that the, the Giants and the A's were both losing pretty bad. I stopped doing this because uh, I, I almost started paying for Postmark. Um, but then I realized everybody's losing, so why do I? Like, no one's going to the game, so it didn't really matter. Um, but I was using Postmark for notifications. I do want to point out that AWS actually has an email client service as well. Uh, so you don't have to use Postmark, but I am using Postmark, which is a, another startup um, type of deal. And um, that's it. And then the, I do want to point out, too, as well, um, so serverless.com is a framework. Um, they made this actually a lot easier. So though there were a lot of steps and a lot of things to like um, orchestrate between getting this app up and running, I use serverless. Uh, and they're, they're local, they're Bay Area startups. Sometimes they sponsor stuff, you might see them around. Um, they, it's very similar to like what I liked about Rails. And the reason why I chose Rails is because I could do like command line generators and all that stuff that Rails devs love. Um, and I was able to just generate a quick API really quickly. Uh, Serverless does that for you as well. So they have a lot of templates where if you wanted like cron jobs or notifications or API, uh, you could actually start one of their, one of their templates. Uh, and they actually support Go and Node at this point, as well as um, not just AWS, but also all those other services that we, I showed on the previous screens. So they do also support IBMs and um, Azure and stuff like that. Actually, I don't think they support Azure. But um, those are the commands I had to start to use uh, to actually create my, my serverless API, my JSON data. And since I already had pretty much the, the skeleton working in Rails, I was able to just convert all my stuff to JavaScript. Uh, I think at this point, there's a lot of services out there. Um, the company that you formerly called Iron.io, they are now a function. Uh, they also write in Ruby. So like, if I wanted now today to move my stuff, just move my Ruby code over to a function, I could today. Uh, I couldn't two years ago, but now at this point, I think everybody's kind of got their skin in the serverless game. So there's probably a solution out, out there if you're like a, a Python dev or anything else like that. Or you should probably should be a JavaScript dev since it's a JavaScript concept, conference. Uh, and I also, I, I hinted as well is that my code's actually open source, so it's called serverless hustle. Um, I've gone back and forth on the spelling. Uh, I actually used to spell it with two S's because I thought it would be cool startup-y, like spell it wrong. Uh, but then I was like, oh, let me try the other way, like the actual right way. And then it was actually taken, the domain was taken. So now it's, I'm just doing H-U-S-T-L. I think I'm kind of sticking with that. So you might see some repos that are spelled different ways. Don't get scared, it's all the same code. Um, and it works. I also want to point out that um, a lot of the support that I got through actually learning serverless came through A Cloud Guru. Um, this is a, a company based out of Australia, and they do a bunch of AWS certifications if, you, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but they also have two serverless courses. I think they might have more at this point. I haven't been on there in a while because uh, I kind of get it at this point. Uh, but definitely check it out there. It's like a $40 course to learn how to do serverless uh, and use the serverless framework as well as use, I think they have one of their courses are, are Firebase focused. So you can use uh, Firebase functions as well. And like I said, everybody's getting their skin in the serverless game. And uh, I, do have a I do a podcast called Jamstack Radio. So I, did, I, I hit you over the head with Jamstacks and Jams because I do a podcast. So definitely check that out where we talk about serverless and serverless framework. I also, this was actually pretty quick. I thought it was going to be a little longer. But the, I wrote this all out in a blog post as well. So if you are into reading and you didn't hear anything I said, uh, feel free to go to this Google saving with serverless. And that is a blog I wrote as well as a blog that I, I saw today on Twitter. Um, someone is using uh, Lambda functions to do some pretty cool things with Gatsby and stuff like that. Um, so check it out. Um, I do have a link there. The slides are at baseball.netlify.com, so definitely check out that uh, if, you don't, if you don't get this link fast enough or you didn't take a picture. And finally, uh, so Netlify actually, I told you everybody's getting their skin in the functions game. Um, Netlify actually has Netlify functions as well, which I have an open PR. We have this open source project called uh, Netlify CMS, which is a, it's an open source CMS uh, with the name Netlify in there. And uh, so we have a, a regular release cycle. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to be notified whenever there was a release cut uh, because I'm not as involved in the project, but I do use it and participate sometimes. So I created a function that watches a GitHub webhook. So whenever there's a release like triggered in GitHub, it notifies the Lambda, and then the Lambda actually fires a tweet and it also fires a blog post, and it also fires a Gitter, because we have a Gitter channel as well. Anybody use Gitter? I'm just curious. Okay, yeah. 
Well, keep using it because you guys are keeping them afloat. So, um, <laughs> so I have a, they have a Gitter channel, and uh, so I sent a Gitter notification saying, "Hey, there's a new release zero dot whatever whatever," and um, so that pull request is still open. So, uh, if one of my coworkers are, are watching one day, please merge that. Um, and I want to give big thanks to Ken Burns, uh, his baseball document documentary. Um, it's like nine, in actually, it's like eleven innings. Uh, each episode's an inning. And I learned a lot, all the baseball facts in the beginning, I actually learned by watching that documentary, um, which I loved. I used to watch it, I have a four-year-old, so I used to watch it uh, while holding and feeding my four-year-old. So, sorry, it's, uh, I'm not trying to tug any tears. But anyway, that's how I learned about baseball, by watching this documentary like at 5 a.m. every morning. Um, and it's really long, so like, tuck her up. Uh, so again, slides, baseball.netwell5.com. Uh, if you are interested, the site itself is at hustlin.netwell5.com. Uh, I do have a form for email. Uh, I know that's kind of people can be scared about in marketing stuff. I do have a note that says I'm not going to sell your information. Like it's literally just going into a key value store. And then when I launch it on the App Store, I'll let everybody know uh, when the app's out there. Or if not, you can just go to that site every morning, uh, which is kind of painful. Um, but it's on Netlify, so it won't go down. Um, so check that out because baseball starts March 29, 2018. First home games are in April. So between the Giants, not the Giants, and they're separate games between the Giants and the A's. So keep that in mind. If you're riding the BART in April and you don't know what's going on, it's because it's baseball. All right, I'm B. Dougie Yo, and that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks.